Uh, welcome to another episode of Breakaway from the Rat Race. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Tom Higgins. Tom is the co-founder and managing partner of Terra Capital. Tom has developed and renovated over 2,000 multifamily units throughout the United States. His uh, projects include everything from duplexes in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to a 1 million square feet uh, skyscraper in the heart of New York City financial district. Before co-founding Terra Capital, Tom spent over a decade working for some of the largest and most successful real estate brokers in the United States, investors, development companies, and where he has he was responsible for over $1.5 billion of real estate assets, acquiring the experience and the knowledge necessary to lead Terra's first class development team. Tom, welcome to the show. Eric, thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Well, this is quite the, the track record. Um, so I'd like to kind of like get like right, right into it and uh, kind of like talk about kind of like wh why you, you went into the, the multifamily. I know you kind of like it's kind of broad. You went from like duplexes in Pittsburgh all the way to like major skyscraper. So the first question that's come to mind is like, this is very broad, but so how do you source your deal? How do you find your deal? So I would just say briefly, it's actually the inverse for me. I started with million square foot oh, okay. <laughs> skyscrapers yeah. and building class A urban infill, as well as class five drive up stick built large multifamily properties. Yeah. And now I have zoomed out and focused on the mini multifamily space. Mm -hmm. So like you said, the bottom, the smallest mini multis are duplexes. Yeah. We don't do many of those, but yeah. we do acquire them. For us, a mini multifamily is a sub 20 unit mm -hmm. property. And so we acquire these sub 20 unit properties in Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Indianapolis. Yeah. We then renovate them to top of market standards. We fully lease them out. We use a lot of property technology to optimize them. Mm -hmm. And then we sell those portfolios as a company to larger institutional investors. Okay. Um, but to answer your sourcing question and, and why I was framing it, we've chose our asset class because one of the main reasons we chose it was access to deals, mm -hmm. especially access to off-market deals. Yeah. As people talk about, and as many people know, there's a massive wealth transfer happening in mm -hmm. the United States. People are retiring. People don't want to manage their properties anymore. Yeah. And that is specifically true in the Midwest mm -hmm. and even more so in this small multifamily space. Yes. Typical assets we're buying, let's call it a 10 unit or eight unit property. Yeah. We're acquiring it from someone that's owned it for many, many years but hasn't renovated it in 10, maybe 20 years. Yeah. And so they may not always feel confident to bring that unrenovated property to the market. They have friends in the neighborhood. They, they don't want photos of their unrenovated property that they're not getting around to fixing up to go out to the market. Yeah. So we come in, we say, you know, everything will just be between us. We'll acquire this. You don't need to pay your broker's fee, et cetera. But to get into the, to the nitty gritty on the acquisitions process, you stop me if I'm going too detailed. But um, well, I just want to interject that so far, I mean, you're right on track. I mean, this is, uh, I bought like uh, five uh, kind of like these smallish uh, apartment buildings, like below 20. So a 16 unit, a 12 perfect. unit, all that. So this you know. is exactly true. I mean, this is a, a gentleman that was self-managing these yep. uh, these apartment buildings, and he wanted to. He didn't want to manage anymore. He was trying to move, do a ten thirty one exchange to a, a triple net uh, building exactly. so that everything was taken care of. And the funny thing is that he didn't want to put money into the the buildings because any kind of renovations or upgrades or anything like that, because he didn't see the value in the buildings. He didn't see that he could actually increase the rent even. He even told us when we were do walking through uh, during the due diligence, and he was telling us that, ah, you know, it's just like, you can't put, don't put too much money into this because you're never going to be able to raise the rent and stuff like that. And so, 
well, good, good sales job, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah. this is, this is exactly true. I mean, this, this group of, uh, of owners and landlords, they want to get out of this on, you know, and they, uh, they want to move on to something else. I mean, they're, they're a little bit older and they 100%. want to cash in and do something different. And it's, yeah, it's just very like, just to add to that, you know, 0% of mini multis are owned by institutional operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, you know, just to, they say 4% of single family rentals or single family homes are owned by institutional operators. From yeah. what I see, that sounds about right. And yeah. then a hundred percent of 150 unit plus deals are all very sophisticated operators. Yeah. So as Terra Capital, and sounds like what you're doing as well, we're bringing sophistication, we're bringing optimization to a overlooked part of the market. But um, back to your original question on yeah. acquisitions. At this point, we acquire a lot of properties. So, uh, and we have, we're in three cities. So we spend a, a good amount of money on our acquisitions and our off-market acquisition strategy. Mm -hmm. we, we buy data from, I think right now we've gotten down to three data providers. Yep. All skip trace data. We started with five. We evaluated the data. We overlaid it on top of each other. Property addresses are all fixed and unique, but everything after the property address, the owner's information, all of that is like where you're buying it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we buy a bunch of lists, we overlay them and we test that data to make sure it's accurate. And then we scrub it every quarter. Mm -hmm. Then we use three main mediums for outreach. We, we have a third party cold calling company that we work with that are all American speakers, English speakers, living abroad, a lot of veterans that we hire. They call for us on those lists. They all have experience acquiring multifamily real estate and they're, they're very well trained. So they know the right questions to ask. They're all very high value leads at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. We send about 1500 mailers a week. So we, we use companies like yellow letters to send out yep. direct letters to the owners. And then the third way, and one that I think is a little bit more unique is that we do emailers. Mm -hmm. So we, we send emails every week and we, we line all this up. So if you've received a phone call a month and a half later, you receive an email a month and a half later, you receive a letter. And we do this year after year. And we, we, so Pittsburgh has 13,000 mini multifamilies. Columbus has 15,000 and Indianapolis has 10,000. Yeah. And so we go through all of those systematically over the course of a year. We've been doing this for some time now. So we've, near to mailed or reached out to probably every owner in the market. And we just do that over and over again. We still get calls. We had, we rebranded in 2021 and we still get calls from 2020 oh, yeah. of our old branding, you know? So yeah. it, it's longevity, uh, building a reputation. And then obviously brokers are extraordinarily important. And we, we participate in pretty much every single on market transaction that happens in our target asset class. But the reality is the amount of properties we buy, we, we wouldn't survive on the on-market deals alone. So yeah. we need to bring, we need to bring buyer, sorry, we need to bring sellers to the market. Yeah. So we have a, we have a team of people. That's, that's what they focus on. A big part of our business is acquiring assets, but you really can get amazing opportunities in this, like you said, in this mini multi space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in, uh, so yeah, this is a long time. So what's, what's the average uh, number of touch points you would you say is People required? Ask that question. I don't have real data on that. Oh, no, okay. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to track that. Yeah. Um, our sense, I I've heard the number seven thrown out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a little less than that. Honest, honest yeah. to God. What okay. I found being Kind of more true is that it's the the way in which you contact them that matters the most. Yeah. Some people like to chat on the phone. They like want someone to call them, talk for 10 minutes, talk about this, talk about that. Some people like letters. I don't, I wouldn't even open it personally, yeah. you know, I don't. but then 
We've seen more so lately. We've had enormous amount of success with emails because mm -hmm. people will just respond. Sure. What were you thinking? Yeah. And now they don't need to have this really personal relationship. It can be a little bit more hands off. And that's been very successful for us. And mm -hmm. then some people like the combination. Oh, I sorry. I missed your call. Thanks for sending me the follow up email. Yeah. Let's schedule a time. You know, yeah. so I, I find that it's more so how you contact these owners yeah. that rather than like how many times you send them a mailer. I, I think a lot of people are sending mailer after mailer after mailer after mailer. Yeah. And that just goes in the trash for a lot of people. So. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of like, yeah, to, to have different touch points, because I think that you don't want to assume that they're going to like email because it's exactly you know, it's very easy to to, uh, you know, uh, ignore email. It's very yes. easy to ignore uh, mail. Uh, phone's a little bit different, but you know, this is still pretty easy. Yeah. But I think so. Yeah, eventually you're gonna find something and say, oh yeah, you know, this is uh, you know, there's a mode that they prefer, um, and then they would respond to that a little bit more. Exactly. Right. But it's different. Yeah, I was shocked. It, so my business partner, his name's Ray. Yeah. He, uh, he was a also, he went to Columbia with me in New York City, yeah. and he's like phenomenal at acquisition strategies. But he was the one that came up with the emailer strategy. I had never heard of it before. And I was very skeptical to your point, right? Like, yeah. isn't going to go right to spam? Aren't people going to ignore it? We had all the data already. Yeah. for When you skip trace, you get all the emails. So I was like, let's give it a shot. And yeah. it's been very, very successful. I mean, every other month we're closing a deal from emails. So, oh, wow. That's good. Very good. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, kind of like the market. Like you, you selected like these three markets. Why did you select these three markets? You're also in New York City. How, how complicated is it to do these deals out of state? Yeah. So I my background was in ground up development, like you mentioned earlier. I started my career in New York City doing private real estate development here, ground up and adaptive reuse. Then I went, I worked for the Lenar Corporation doing multifamily development okay. in New, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. Institutional wow. company, basically a utility for housing, you know? Yep. And um, during that process, I had exposure to one, a lot of best in class systems, yeah. But the, the other side of that is a lot of data analytics and a lot of conversations about capital markets, a lot of conversations about market selection. Yeah. My business partner and I started doing syndications in college really early on, you know, wholesaling syndications, slowly growing our portfolio in New York City because it was in our backyard. Yeah. And everything that is wrong with New York City <laughs> is what's right with our new our, our new and improved yeah. strategy. Yeah. We did very well with our deals, but it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't scalable. We were finding little home run deals here and there, but it was always drama, always headwinds, always something like the felt like the city was against us yeah. every every turn. Yeah. So you know, um, you know, overweighted in tech having rents rise too quickly over competition yeah. all these things that were wrong with new york city uh yeah. was what was right with the markets we do in the midwest yeah. but to be a little bit more specific terra capital when we select a market we believe very heavily in this concept of investing in a healthy market mm -hmm. and what that means for us is a lot of different things but just to kind of pinpoint a few of them. Yeah. It's it's job growth mm -hmm. in your target demographics. Yeah. In sectors that are historically recession resistant. Mm -hmm. So for example, our asset type caters to 22 to 35 year olds. Yeah. Within that 22 to 35 year old professional sector, what jobs are the best and survive the longest during downturns mm -hmm. for us that looks like healthcare yeah it's like education manufacturing logistics mm -hmm. yeah. more importantly than all of this it's the low cost 
professional services jobs. Mm -hmm. It's the accountants, it's the low cost bankers, it's the X, Y, Z, right? Th those jobs are in Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Indianapolis. They're in the Midwest. So that's really one of the largest pillars that hold up a healthy market. The other one, and as important as the first, is what is the average income of our target demographic, right? What is the average medium income AMI of our demographics in the areas in which we buy properties? Yeah. And let's say for argument's sake, it's $100 a year. We want to be able to have our numbers work, have our deals work with rent being $25 or less, right? I'm using a hundred as a, just an example, yeah. hundred or a hundred percent of their salary. We want to be 25% of their salary or less going to rent. Yeah. And that I call it the golden line. It's going away. Like no coastal city has that no. anymore. You know, 40%, 45%. It's, it's really, it's really incredible, but <clears throat> that is a really important foundational element to a market for a number of reasons, but two of them that I think are kind of very interesting is, is one, if you have more money, you can save, you can also enjoy the amenities in the cities that you have. Yeah. So your quality of life is higher. Yeah. So let's like, let's flip that on its head for a second. If you're making a hundred dollars and 45 of those dollars are going to rent every month, yeah. your quality of life starts to go down. Yeah. When your quality of life starts to go down and you're not planning on moving because you have family there, you have a job there, et cetera. What can happen is that the, the people in the neighborhoods can band together and mm -hmm. vote people into power that push for rent reform and rent control. Yeah. And people often say like, oh, it's a red state thing. Sorry, it's a blue state thing. That never happened in my hometown. But what have we been seeing lately, even in your state? we're seeing traditionally red areas of the United States pushing through rent, rent control, rent stabilization, yeah. because the people are so unhappy and they're the ones that vote ultimately. It's not a, as much as people want to say it's a property rights issue, it's a political issue. It's a quality of life conversation more than anything else. So we like to be in those markets that show steady, resilient, resistant, long-term growth yeah. with good underlying job sectors that have appropriate population growth in our markets that don't have to pay too much in rent every month. So that's yeah. how we pick our markets. Yeah. And, uh, and I mentioned earlier, we need to have the inventory to be able to do our strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, if your strategy is to buy a thousand unit buildings, you need yeah. a market that has a thousand unit buildings. The same for mini multis. We need these eight units. We need these six units. We need these 10 unit properties yeah. in the neighborhoods that we like to buy. And that's what exists. You know, the Midwest, this, this whole area, a lot of these homes are originally built as single family homes in the early 1900s. And then between the 1930s to 1960s, they were converted to multifamilies. Yeah. And, and those are the properties that we're buying and now renovating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we had, we had very similar criteria, even for single family rentals. Also, we want to have like sustainable population growth. We didn't want to have things that were too much out of whack where, you know, it was growing too fast and the price <laughs> was crazy. You can't find deals and then it's, exactly. everything goes, goes wrong. Great job growth uh, and um, low unemployment, and also in key sectors. So definitely in healthcare, education. I mean, you do Pittsburgh, so uh, you know so there's a lot of good education there. Lots of. I also like high tech. Also, so high tech is also not a good one. Um, logistics was also a good one in Memphis, and uh, because they had a big distribution center. Yeah, FedEx. Indianapolis has yeah. huge um, logistics, and it's only growing. Yeah. FedEx just acquired a massive airport in yeah. Indy. So that's a big part of it. The other thing, and we were also kind of like looking at Amazon, what Amazon was doing in terms of the warehouses and stuff yeah, like exactly. that. And though they kind of calmed down now on the yeah. on the on the acquisition for these warehouses. Uh, the other criteria we had that you didn't mention was uh, landlord friendly. So this is something that that we're looking for. Uh, and I know that, but you kind of uh, you kind of talked about that. You talked about 
the fact that because it was affordable, because your average median income for your target demographic was about 25% of their gross rent for the year, then it was affordable and it was, then people would be able to have a good quality of life. So they wouldn't be some kind of rebellion Correct. against the landlord Correct. and then demanding that the uh, demanding rent control and demanding all these things. Yeah, I find I find this concept of landlord friendly yeah. to be the symptom of a disease yeah. rather than the disease itself. Yeah. So many people like to be like, oh, I love Florida because it's landlord friendly. It's like, yeah. look, one city council meeting gone south. Yeah. <laughs> it's not landlord friendly anymore. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think as custodians of other people's money and as real estate investors that are, are, you know, taking a step deeper into data, yeah, it's our responsibility as it is yours to like, it's not okay. The, the laws are good today. It's like, yeah, exactly. where, where are the laws going to be in, you know, if you ask me like, Hey, um, you know, do you think that New York city is going to, continue to get less landlord friendly over time, I would tell you, yes, even though it makes me sad, even though it's not economically sustainable. Yeah. It's just that because it's really a symptom of this over competition, yeah. over demand, under supply, structural constraints. You know? Yeah. And I really like that approach because it's much more, uh, I think it's a little bit more of a leading indicator because exactly. you could see that if your AMI, your average median income is is 25% today, but there's a massive, all of a sudden you have a massive, exactly. I'm just thinking like Austin. It's Texas, a great example. Right. Great example. Yeah. And then all of a sudden your rent doubles. Exactly so right. Now you're at, you're at 45, 50% exactly right. uh, of your, uh, of your gross, gross uh, AMI that's going to exactly. rent that now you're not happy anymore. Now you're yeah. going to stand up. You're going to go to the city council. You're going to demand exactly. that. Hey, you have to stop doing this. You have that. You have to do something. I can't afford to be here anymore. And now I'm I'm a I'm a 29 year old aspiring politician mm -hmm. going to the city council meetings, hearing everyone's complaints. Yeah. I go on TikTok. I say I'm here for you guys. I'm gonna solve this. Yeah, yeah. I don't care what party you're in. Independent, red, blue, pink, yellow. Like, yeah, you're gonna get support because you're solving. Yeah. theoretically solving right yeah. a short-term issue mm -hmm. that people are having because of everything we just talked about so yeah yeah so i really like i really like the way you kind of like measure that as opposed to looking at landlord friendly like you said i mean these are the laws today but yes. this, this could change dramatically exactly and um, so yeah so i think I, I really like that so that's very good um, so tell me a little bit more about kind of like, so you mentioned your target demographic, so that was good. Um, now you source deal by basically going after them, trying to find off market deal, you get your list of properties and all that kind of stuff, you email, you, you, uh, you uh, call them, and uh, you send them some mailers. Now you have some people calling in, and then they say, hey, yeah, I wanna, I'm interested in selling the, the, my property. Um, so what's your acquisition process at that point? What is so that? It, as, as much as I wish I was still uh, involved with it on a daily oh. basis, they, uh, and I try to be involved. Our, we have a, we have a good team based here in New York city, yeah. um, all acquisitions analysts. That's what they do. That's what they're trained to do. Yeah. And I try to stick my nose into the process as much as I can, but uh, I think they're it's sick of me. Get yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's what they're trained to do. They, they yeah. take that warm lead and we close it and we have, you know, systemized the whole process. We have our same due diligence process that we do on every single deal. We mm -hmm. use more or less the same consultants every single time. Yeah. We, you, have we, consult, you have consultants on the ground over there yeah. that are going to do and the then, due diligence and everything. Yeah. And then like, as we, so, and our acquisition analysts will see and walk every single property before we acquire it as yeah. well. Um, yeah. So our, our process is, is just, we've done it so many times now that it's become very ironclad and we're not compromising, but people understand. And we have a lot of repeat sellers too, that have like 
Yeah. We bought from them one year, we buy from them the next. So yeah. they're used to our process. Yeah. And when we provide an offer, we're like, this is the offer. Here's the things that we normally find. This is about what it would cost if we need to repair that. So, so we kind of go in pretty transparent and people like that. And yeah. I've replaced more sewer lines than I can count. I can tell you how much it costs, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know what a roof's going to cost. I know what repairing a rim joist is going to cost. I know what sistering five joists in a basement is going to cost. So it's a it's a um, efficient process at this point. But yeah. one thing I do really love, and I would recommend anyone that is uh, you know acquiring properties, and it's pretty pretty low cost, and we get a lot of value out of it. But we we every time we think it, we get into a due diligence period, we do a Matterport or the three D scan of the yeah. property, and mm -hmm. then we do it once we've completed it as well. Okay. And it's a really cool way. And it, this is on my website too. If you want to walk through, I, yeah. I, we update it time from time for different properties that we've done. Yeah. Um, our website's usaterra.com and you can walk through uh, our only our completed acquisitions because often there's personal effects in the preliminary one. So we don't yeah. share those because yeah. we don't want people's privacy to be um compromised. Yeah. But my point was, it's so nice to be able to, even when we're on phones with contractors and we're at another job site, I can go on my phone, walk into the kitchen and they'd be like, Hey, do you want the tile here or here? We can be like, Oh um, no, you don't, you shouldn't put tile on that wall. Put it on this wall. Yeah. Because you have it right at your, on your iPhone. Oh, it's that's incredible. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's yeah. Matterport. And what, what tool is that? That's it's called Matter. It's called Matterport. Okay. And Matterport has a marketplace where people like you can hire people directly through them. So you don't need to go find someone to do it. And then I believe you can buy one yourself. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We hire through their platform. It's just more yeah. streamlined for us. Yeah. But if you if you wanted to, you could do it yourself as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. And it's not it's not expensive. I mean, it's it's a it's a hundred few hundred dollar thing. This isn't okay. like a, you know. Yeah. So I get a lot of value out of that. Okay. So uh, what? Any idea in terms of? Uh, so I know you're not part of the acquisitions team anymore. They kicked you out. But yes. uh, do you remember? Uh, kind of like, do you know your acquisition criteria? What kind of? For sure. Yeah. So I sit on every investment committee approval. Oh, okay. So, so you know so, that. <laughs> after yeah. So once we go through the due diligence process, you know, we have a, a handful of meetings along the way. But we have our final meeting, and yeah, we we acquire. Typically, especially right now, yeah. our average and the way we analyze properties is we do it on a stabilized yield on cost approach. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of the great equalizer in multifamily real estate. It's like mm -hmm. you you take the frills away and you can really know how much if you invest a dollar or a hundred dollars, how many dollars you're going to get back every year. So yeah. we were able to stabilize our, our first portfolio in Pittsburgh in uh, the mid 8% yield on cost. And our current buy trajectory, if we took the average of our last 10 deals, would yeah. just be low nines, high 8% yield on okay. cost. Okay. Portfolios trade. But that's after it's stabilized, right? Is that? That's stabilized okay. yield on cost. Okay. And um, because every property we buy is different. It, sometimes yeah. there's half occupied. Sometimes it's fully occupied. So yeah, yeah, the way yeah. to really equalize it for our analysis is to look at your stabilized yield on cost okay. and we care less about your entry yield on cost okay. we buy all properties with construction financing or bridge financing yeah and then we renovate it and then we get stabilized loans okay we get our stabilized loans we typically go out as a portfolio so we'll put five mini multis together. So we're going 50 units at a time. Yeah. We do not cross collateralize our loans, but we often get better rates because we're offering more units at once. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then oh, we oh, just, I see. So you, you put them as a, you put them as a portfolio or you're going multiple properties at the same time with the same finance. Is that how you're doing yeah, it? Yeah. So, so, so we have a line of credit with okay. a handful of uh, private lenders, mm -hmm. the, the most notable being Corvest, their oh, very okay, yeah. I know Corvest. popular one. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we have a line of credit with Corvest. We draw on that line of credit. We renovate the properties 
And yeah. then once we have a group of properties that are all similarly situated in Columbus, for example, we yeah. go to our list of lenders that we worked with numerous times and we say, hey, we have five deals. Yeah. We are not going to cross collateralize these deals. Yeah. But you could do all five at once. Okay. Give us a rave. Okay. And it's it's important to not cross collateralize. Oh, yeah. Because it's it's just like, it, it's like, why tie your hands? Like for yeah. whatever reason, one of your property ha has a gold mine underneath it that you didn't see yeah. and you want to sell it tomorrow. Yeah. You can't sell it now. Exactly. You know? so it doesn't make sense. Yeah. No, um, I agree. What about the property management? So do you have, do you have your own property management company or? Yeah. You... So we own a property management company. Okay. Every company I've worked for has always been vertically integrated. Okay. My feeling I would never want to give up the leasing part of a asset management, property management. Yeah. I, I would never want to give that up. I think it's just the real way to drive value is to like market your properties really well, yeah. lease them well, qualify your own tenants. So because of that, I would never end up outsourcing property management. That's just my philosophy and also just my training, you know, okay. 10 years working for companies that always own their own property management company. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we start on our, we buy our first deal in a market on our own balance sheet. We use that to start vetting people. Yeah. We start with 1099s in the sub market for maintenance and other items. Yeah. And then as we hit a critical mass within our portfolio, we bring on a W2 yeah. under our property management company okay that sounds good yeah that's all right good. good way to scale up yeah uh, so let's talk about the, so the capital stack you kind of touched on that a little bit on the refi at the once the property stabilize so what does the capital stack look like at sure the so capital stack so we typically are acquiring these properties on entry i would say our average equity on the acquisitions is about 35% of the total acquisition cost. Yeah. And the rest is bridge financing. Bridge and then a hundred percent of our construction is okay. also bridge financing. Okay. And um, we invest in these through a private, a captive private equity fund. Okay. It's a, it's a reg D 506 C accredited investors okay. offering. It's our second fund. Okay. Um, we also do syndications um, or and programmatic joint ventures. Mm -hmm. But the main way that people get involved with investing with us is through that fund vehicle. Fun, yeah. Larger real estate companies that aren't set up to invest in funds will partner with. But mm -hmm. the main the main system is that is that reg D offering. Yeah. And and so that we we call the capital you know, quarterly. And yeah. so we have the cash in our accounts. We acquire the properties at closing with a company like Corvest. We also worked with Lending One. They're great. We work with Patch of Land. They're great. We've had a handful of good um, bridge financing partners that we've done a lot of deals with. Yeah. And then once the, the um, deal is fully renovated, I talked through how we stabilize it. Our typical... Yeah. LTV at stabilization is 65%. Oh, really? Wow. And, and um, the 65% LTV is typically slightly more in, in total debt than yeah. the bridge loan and the acquisition loan. Yeah. It's, we, we're not trying to make money via refis. We're yeah. trying to be capitally efficient yeah. because we do a lot of deals. So the, so the goal is not to be like, oh, we had a big cash out refi. It's to, to make sure it, so it's all working in line correctly. Yeah. Um, and then if we do have additional proceeds from the refinance, we'll use that as a sources and uses for future deals for the okay. fund okay. And, and to avoid large distributions and then calling the capital later. Okay. And then we do. We do quarterly distributions to our LPs of all the NOI after debt service. 90% of it goes towards um, our investors okay. every awesome. quarter. Yeah. So have you uh, found, I mean, the, the, mar the financing market and all of that is uh, kind of uh, 
interesting right now i'd say the yeah. least so with the interest rate a little bit off of where they were last year at the end of last year but uh, they're still higher than they were like uh, a couple of years ago uh and i think a lot of the uh the lending criteria have uh, have tightened up a little bit uh, have you found that it was more difficult uh, to get loans on your uh, on your deals uh today than it would it was like a couple of years ago and how do you how do you kind of manage that yeah so first thing as an operator i would say it's i've been surprised about how it's manifesting mm -hmm. in our market in the mini multi space it's not so much about the relationship between your stabilized yield and your interest rate where that's a massive issue for large scale multifamily mm -hmm. if you're buying four caps or three caps in austin and you need to refi yeah. at a six percent you have a serious issue yeah yeah but it even manifests itself in my space where we're stabilizing at an 8% yeah. or 9% and we're getting debt at a six. So leverage is still accretive to us. Our debt service ratio is totally fine, yeah. but it's like almost there's carbon dioxide in the offices of these lenders yeah. because <laughs> look, and, and this isn't true for all of them. We have certain lenders that are, that you're already approved and they're very efficient, but yeah. more so just a feeling of the general market yeah. things are just slower and yeah. things are just like we had we had a period of time where we had to switch lenders because they we had to get a last minute extension for the first time for us we were already approved everything done yeah and they had just liquidity issues and uh um, yeah, that's what that's what i found a lot of them they just yeah they're going through the motions and then exactly. they okay now we need to fund the deal and i have a feeling that they're trying to stall Yes, okay. that's how it feels to me too. You can give us is... another rent roll, you know. And it's exactly. Like... <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, we need we need this week's yeah. collections. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's really interesting. And so our re response as a fund, and this really is only possible in our markets, in our asset class, and given the current macroeconomic environment, mm -hmm. we do all deals financing contingent now. Okay. Uh, which is not something we used to do. Yeah. And it makes your offer less competitive. Yeah. But the reality is, is that anyone that's not doing it likely isn't operating in the market really. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, there's, there's some, we, we do syndications, as I mentioned in the mid market. Yeah. So, so something that's not sub 20 units, but is under that 80 unit threshold where we can apply our same prop tech mm -hmm. strategies We'll, we'll yep. do those outside of the fund as, as uh, you know, sidecars and or standalone syndications because we, we stumble upon them as we acquire the, the 20 units. A lot of those owners will also have, oh, I have this 40 unit you want to look at. We're yeah. like, look, it doesn't work for our fund, yeah, but, yeah. you know, we know some people that like to buy these. We're happy to take a look at it. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I bring that up, that marketplace, that 40 to 80 unit marketplace is historically never financing contingent. Mm -hmm. and we're not, we won't do deals unless it's yeah. financing contingent. Yeah. Uh, and if sometimes people mentally, those owners don't want to do a fully financing contingent, but so you can kind of negotiate around it and be like, look, 10,000 of the money will go hard, yeah. but the rest will be financing contingent. Yeah. So you can be flexible, yeah. but it's important to hedge yourself because of, like you said, the lack of liquidity for our lenders. Yeah. Have you found in some uh, more potential on the seller financing side of things? We just, we moved too quickly to, to we're, oh, yeah. we just, I don't have, I, people have brought it up to me. I know nothing about seller finance. We, we had chatted before about like topics. I don't know anything about that's one. I know nothing about, <laughs> and it's, um, um, I, I think it could be, it's, I get it. Like psychologically, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And maybe there's a version of our business that does that. And it's probably in our third fund, we create a very, like a prop tech or we partner with a property technology company and a loan servicer yeah. that does it in a very buttoned up way. Yeah. I'm fine with that. It's just whatever we do needs to be scalable and repeatable. 
Yeah. So I couldn't be like negotiating mortgage terms with every owner. Yeah. Um, but if I, if I had like a prescriptive solution that I could put in the mix, Hey, if you check this box on the contract, if you want to do seller financing, then yeah. I, then it, then it would work for us, but yeah. we just haven't set that up yet. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, Tom, we are kind of like uh, at this stage where we are trying to wrap up. Uh, if people want to uh, connect with you, if they have more questions, they want to participate in your fund sure. or in a future syndication, how to, how do, can they get a hold of you? Yeah. So easiest way is our website, usaterra.com. I'm sure it will be in the, the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Via via that link, you can sign up for our newsletter, which we are very active on and I'm heavily involved with. I really enjoy kind of giving my thoughts on what's going on in the multifamily real estate market, as well as you know providing future opportunities through that platform. And then there's also access to our current offering. Um, I'm not sure exactly when this will air, but um, we still have some room at mm -hmm. the moment and yep. there's an invest now button uh, that brings us to we partnered with juniper square and okay. they have great um i'm sure you've heard of it they have a great kind of uh, investor management software that we yep. use yeah very good well tom thank you very much and uh it was a great conversation thank you for sharing your experience with, with us and i'll see you next week awesome thank you thank you for having me Thank you for listening to Break Away from the Rat Race with your host, Eric Martel. If you want to share your story and experience with our listeners, please message us on Facebook at Break Away from the Rat Race. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our podcast on iTunes.